Hello, Tim. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, we are live. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Happy after Labor Day Tuesday, which is a special one. Yes, yes. So everyone, we are here on episode number 83 of Showing Up Perspectives on Cancer. This show was created as a safe space where cancer patients, survivors, and supporters from all around the world come together to share their stories and connect as well as find resources that provide healing, hope, and resilience. My name is Tim Sohn, a 16-year cancer warrior, host of Showing Up Perspectives on Cancer, and author of Perspectives on Cancer, Cancer Patients, Survivors, and Supporters Share Their Story, and, and creator of this little event coming up, the Showing Up Perspectives on Cancer in-person event, which is September 30th and October 1st. Over to you, Erica. Oh my gosh. Well, it is so good to see you. So you too. Tim and everyone, I am Erica Newbert Campbell. I am a five year breast cancer survivor. I also have other perspectives on cancer. I am the leader of a nonprofit organization called the Pinky Swear Foundation. And I've also spent nearly 25 years volunteering at a summer camp for children with cancer. And I've Amazing. also called myself, I know it's like a how is that? How does years go by like that? Seriously. It's crazy. Um, and I'm also a cancer orphan after losing my mother to breast cancer 15 years ago. And lots of time has passed, Tim. I feel like I've been in this cancer space for like a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what sure. makes all of our perspectives unique. Some of, some of you may be just entering that journey. Some of you may be um, long time in this, in this space. And our show is all about everyone in between, meaning everyone is welcome and we create community here. We have the best, best network on LinkedIn and the best viewers. So my invitation is right in the chat, what is your connection to cancer and where are you from right now? I also have another bonus homework is say hello to somebody in the chat that you know, maybe say hello to someone in the chat that you don't know, and begin to continue to build that community for us because we all have our own perspectives and we're all on this journey together. So well said, Erica, as always. Before we bring our guest on, and I'm really excited for our guest today, uh, David McBee. Before we bring him on, I just want to remind everyone about the in-person Showing Up Perspectives on Cancer event. It is September 30th and October 1st in Scranton, Pennsylvania at Marywood University. And uh, we have people signing up from literally all over the country, from California to Texas to Connecticut. All the time zones are, are covered. Um, but we would love to have you here or there as well. So. Uh, definitely go to perspectivesoncancer.com and you can find out all the information. You can register. The event is now free thanks to all of the sponsors. Erica, we have, I think it's 24 sponsors for the event. Oh my gosh. Right? Plus, um, people have donated through a GoFundMe over $1,000 to help support cancer patients with travel expenses to come to the event as well. That Shout makes my out. heart sing, Tim, because again, it's mm. these are the hidden costs of cancer. And for all of our sponsors and other really generous humans to cover the cost of travel, it's fantastic. Yeah. And I think that's just an incredible sense of humanity and generosity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. Erica, over to you to introduce our amazing guest for today. Okay. Well, if you're excited, please write in the chat, heck yeah, because we're going to be introducing David McVie. Uh, he, since being diagnosed with cancer, I cannot wait for this. Um, many things have gotten better in David's life. Now I did say that many things have gotten better in David's life. And that's what we're going to explore today. His anger issues are 99% gone. His relationships are better. His health minus the cancer is actually better. His ability to handle stress is better, his sleep is better, and his relationship with God is better. Now, if that is not an intriguing introduction, I don't know what is. Please welcome to the show, David McBee. Hello, hello. Hi, welcome, David. David. Thanks for being Hi. on the show. I feel like you just spoiled the whole interview. You just gave it all away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We want to know more. We get to know more. 
<laughs> we definitely want to know more. Well, I'm really grateful to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you for saying yes. Thank you for mm -hmm. saying yes. And Absolutely. before we dive into the conversation with David, we just want to say thank you to everyone who's showing up, whether you're tuning in live or on the replay. Uh, Betty is here. She says hello. So welcome, Betty. Welcome, Betty. Hello to the LinkedIn user. Let us hello. know who you are. We would love to know. <laughs> Russ Hedge is here. Russ Hedge is going to be at the in-person event. Yay, See really you nice. in a few weeks, Russ. Um, Mark Kageyama is here. He's going to be our keynote speaker at the event. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Mark. Uh, LinkedIn user is a 16-year and counting paranotial mesothelioma survivor. Wow. 16-year. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Like I said, thank you all of you who are who are joining us live or on the replay. Uh, like Erica said before, let us know uh, what your connection to cancer is and where where you are tuning in from, for sure. So, David, are you ready to to dive into the conversation? I am ready. Let's go. All right, sounds great. So, David. What was it like getting a cancer diagnosis? Tell us, tell us your story. Take us back there. Well, I did one of those uh, colonoscopies you're supposed to do. I actually waited till I was 51 to do it. But um, after the colonoscopy, the doctor said, you're all clear, you're all good, no colon cancer. There was a little nodule somewhere in there. We're not too worried about it. Um, we're going to probably just uh, check that out. We biopsied it. So I was like, okay, no big deal. I got a nodule, whatever the heck that means, right? Right. And um, about a week later, I, I get a phone call from the doctor. I'm actually on the other line, so I can't answer. And he leaves a voicemail saying that, um, you heard me right. He left a voicemail saying mm -hmm. that I needed to go and uh, meet with an oncologist right away. So that was kind of a crappy uh, way to find out that I had cancer. I told my wife, she came running home from school with tears in her eyes. It, it was pretty scary. Um, I was diagnosed with neuroendocrine tumors or what is often referred to as NETS, uh, N-E-T-S. And neuroendocrine tumors are, um, they're one of the cancers that you kind of want if you have to get cancer because they are super slow growing. Um, if you catch them early, you can you can really hold them off and and continue to live a long life, which is what I intend to do. Um, awesome. When I Googled it, it said a 97 uh, percent uh, uh, survival rate. So I was like, oh, I got this. No big deal. So, Tim, to answer your question, being diagnosed with cancer wasn't such a big deal. But sure. the prognosis, the prognosis when I actually went to the doctors was the part that stung because. The cancer had moved on past my large colon into my liver and they found another dozen tumors inside my liver as well. And so that meant stage four, um, that meant that the cancer was going to kill me at some point. That's kind of what they said. And they gave me a, a number, which I don't like to say out loud of how many years that I would, uh, get to live. And it was not a number I was very happy with. Um, so that was the harder part. The diagnosis, not so bad. I thought, no big deal. I got this. I've met a lot of cancer survivors. This is just another part of my story. The prognosis, not so, not so fun. Um, shall I continue? Like, there's a little more to the story. So, yeah. Um, I mean, can we just back up a minute? You're, yeah. Okay. You're, who is it that left you a voicemail? Um, my GI. Your uh, GI gastrointestinal. Left your yeah. It's so wow. like, what was, what was going on in your mind when you, when you got that voicemail and why would they do that on a voicemail? I mean, seriously, right? what was going on in my mind was back on that. <laughs> my, my mind was just like, this has got to be a mistake. Like yeah. he's just being overly cautious, right? Surely this isn't anything to worry about, but yeah, when you get the words neuroendocrine cancer, you know, like and you hear, you know, you, the minute you hear the C word, you think. I'm going to die. Right. Um, I didn't actually feel that way right up front. I was like, oh, I can beat it. But then when they gave me the prognosis, then I was scared out of my mind. 
So after the prognosis, they said, let's get into surgery. Let's, this is one of the cancers you try to cut out and get rid of. Um, it was uh, September 8th, a year ago. So almost to the date that we're talking right now. Wow. Wow. And uh, they, they gave me a big old long scar uh, from here to way down there, you know, and uh, took all my body parts out, took a big section of my large and small intestines, took my gallbladder, took 25% of my liver to get rid of all the tumors they could. Uh, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a mean, mean surgery, but yeah. I, it, it was pretty successful. They got all the tumors out. Um, but, but again, this is such a unique cancer. It's not the kind that goes away ever. Um, not the doctor didn't say it might come back. The doctor said it will come back. Like there's just no question. It will come back. And we thought it would be years before I'd see it again. But um, March of this year, I got diagnosed with three more tumors in my liver. So that's liver. kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had those removed? No, they are small enough and not causing any complications that uh, we are just uh, watching them. I'm on a drug called lanreotide, which um, is a growth hormone suppressant. And this is a growth hormonal cancer. So um, for six months, they've just been stable, just sitting there, chilling out. And I'm fine with that. They can live there as long as they just leave me alone. They leave you alone. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that is, yeah, that's a lot to process mentally and emotionally, let alone physically, which I'm sure with a scar from here to here, that's going to be some physical healing first. But so what was the hardest, what has been the hardest part of living with this cancer and this news? And, you know, on the flip side, you know, where are you seeing joy and a silver lining? Uh, well, for my money, the hardest part is just the constant fear that the tumors will spread, you know, yeah. um, that they will, uh, you know, populate other parts of my body or multiply and, you know, eventually take me. Uh, that's, that's a scary thing to live with. Right. Uh, yeah. doctor says I'm doing real good. I've got years ahead of me, but you know, there are other neuroendocrine tumor patients who discover a tumor in their lungs and they're gone six weeks later. Uh, so I feel like, um, I feel like I have this monster just living in my closet and I've locked him up and I try to ignore him yep. and, uh, you just never know when he's going to break down the door. So it's living with that constant fear. And I think that is true of a lot of cancer survivors, whether or not they, uh, got rid of it or not, they're always oh, yeah. going to go back for that annual scan and just be afraid that monster's going to, you know, come back and visit. So that's the hard part. Oh, for sure. I've talked about this on the show that, um, after my cancer, I actually worked with a therapist. I needed some mental health counseling about managing that fear that you talk about, David, because it's so easy to go into dark places so quick mentally. And, you know, who knows where that can take you. So I'm, I'm curious, just as a quick follow up, I mean, are you working on any kind of tools mentally to help you manage through that fear? Uh, yes, actually, I, uh, I see an alternative healer. Uh, every three or four months. Uh, he was uh, trained by a Native American medicine man and spent 20 years in China with some gurus over there. And uh, we practice a lot of uh, mental healing and uh, mm. meditation. And and so, yes, I, I work very, very hard on managing that fear. Oh, I feel like I'd like that person's phone number. I mean, <laughs> or like everyone, every cancer patient should have that on speed dial. I really, I really believe that the mind is such an important part of the healing journey. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, is it okay if I give him a shout out? Absolutely. Yes. It, his name is Ben Ufana and his website is B-E-N-O-O-F-A-N-A.com. Amazing. I'm sure I, I know Tim's on it. He'll put it in the chat. Um, that is um, that's great. I mean, because I think, again, the, the hardest part is 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 up here after they hand, they they deal with the uh, the physical side. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I mean, so what's your silver lining on all this? So many, honestly. You said it in my introduction. I uh, I started taking my own health much more seriously. Like my blood pressure is the best it's ever been. My 
my cholesterol is the best it's ever been. I exercise five days a week. I eat better. I'm mostly a pescatarian. Um, just making just smarter choices every day about my physical health. And my mental health is something that I never really took care of. I have a stressful job, but I would work 10 hours a day. Just go, 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 go. I loved the work, so I didn't really think of it as a stressful job, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but in hindsight, now I realize just how much pressure I would put on myself to accomplish a lot in a short amount of time. And so I've just made balance a higher priority. Wow. I find peace every day. And and one fun thing that I've kind of learned is I can tell when I'm amped up. Like, like I will literally be like, okay, I can feel it in my body now. I pay attention to my body. This is one of the things that Ben taught me is to feel the emotions that are going on. And I'm like, okay, I need to stop. I need to sit down. I need to listen to the ocean. I need to read. I need to listen to some music. I need to breathe. And I can just literally change my entire mental and physical state um, now because I know what to look for. That is incredible. Well, as a slightly not so recovered workaholic myself, um, <laughs> just disclosing, um, did you quit your job or do you still have the job, but you've mentally changed your mindset around it? No, I still have the same job I've had for 10 years and um, I still work just as hard as I always did, but I, I stop, I go for 10 minute walks. I take the dogs out like six times a day. I'm going on these 10 minute walks. That's an entire hour out of my day. Right. But for me, it's totally worth it. And for whatever reason, I'm actually more productive in less time. And That's I amazing. can't really explain that, but um, I'm still able to accomplish all of my goals, even, I don't know, it's like, um, it's like when you fill a glass with a bunch of ice cubes and you think the glass is full, but then there's plenty of room for water in there too. I just had to find room for that water. So yeah, um, yeah I spend a lot more time taking care of myself. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah uh, that's great. Yeah. Tim, over to you. I, I could, yeah. uh, this is like something I'm working on actively, David. So I'm yeah. like really intrigued by this. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. So everybody, we're here on Showing Up Perspectives on Cancer. Our guest is David McBee. Let us know as we go through the conversation if you have any questions for David, myself, or Erica. Uh, so David, I'm curious, what have you learned over this as this over this past year if you as you've been going through your journey? I read a book many, many moons ago called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. You guys have probably heard of it, right? Yeah. Great book. Mm -hmm. And I probably read it three or four times. And I would try to live by that motto. But the reality was I just I just always sweated the small stuff. And what I have learned now is that nothing compares to a cancer diagnosis. Doesn't matter what is going on at work or crash a car, whatever. Like as long as you have your health, I mean, nothing else matters. So it's like, I've learned to appreciate life and not worry so much about the little things that used to really, really bother me. And I did let them bother me. I had some severe OCD and like you said, some anger issues I had to work through. Uh, today, it just, they really just don't bother me like they used to. So I've definitely learned a lot there. Wow. How, David, how did, how did you get through or past some of those anger issues, if you don't mind sharing? Well, uh, before being diagnosed with cancer, I thought the solution was reading self-help books. That's what my book, Everyday Lessons Every Day, is all about, my journey to improve myself through reading self-help books. Um, but one of the things that I've actually discovered is that I was using a positive mental attitude as an intellectual bypass. And let me explain what I mean by that. Yeah, and this is something that. that, yeah, this is something that Ben helped me understand as well. So I would be going down a road and something would irritate me, make me angry, you know, um, not a literal road, but you know, just, I was going down whatever path I was on and something would bother me. And I would say to myself, okay, 
everything you read, you read in these self-help books says, don't let that bother you and have a positive mental attitude. So instead of dealing with my anger or my feelings and digesting them and moving past them and continuing down the road, I would take this intellectual bypass onto happy highway where the positive mental attitude rules, right? And this is the sure. version of myself that I would present to the world. So when people found out I had anger issues or a lot of stress, they just had a hard time believing it because David McBee is always, you know, so positive. And now David McBee is still positive, but he takes those moments and he examines them and he feels them and he experiences them. So they don't get stuck in my gut, which is where my cancer is. And I don't know how many of your viewers buy into the idea that emotions and stress can make you sick, but, but I believe that I believe that the, the hormones or the, the, the gene that was the malfunctioned that gave me this cancer, you know, I may have triggered it with all that anger that I had suppressed and swallowed up over the years. I totally believe that by the way. <laughs> yeah. 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 I see you. I feel you. Yeah. I mean, there's, I've also said that I, I pretty much, I'm certain I manifested my own cancer for sure. For sure. I, I just, I own I just, that actually, you know, the, the world is full of toxins and yeah. terrible things that cause cancer, but there are some people that live in that same world with us that they don't get it. Like, what yeah. is the difference? You know? Okay. And by the way, that number is getting smaller and smaller. I thought the stat was one in four people will get diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. I Googled it recently. It's one in two. One in two people. Wow. One in two? Yes. At some point in our lives, we'll get diagnosed with cancer. Wow. That's ridiculous, isn't it? That is ridiculous. That's 50%. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Whew. Yeah, we got to do something about it. Um, yeah. so David, how has cancer impacted your relationships? Um, cancer made all of my relationships better, honestly. Um, isn't that, isn't that bizarre? I got you. I get you, but I want to hear more, but isn't that like the funniest thing to say? Well, it is like you, when, when, when you get cancer, everyone comes out of the woodwork to tell you they love you and they th are thinking about you. And, um, boy, it just, it's the nicest thing. Yeah. I, I I told my friends I you know what I wanted, what I needed. Whatever, like, what can I do? What can I do? And I told them I'd love a selfie check in. And Tim, you know this, right? You've sent me plenty of them. Yeah. Um, a selfie check in is just when you take a picture of yourself, send it to your friend. No words, no context at all. It just tells them you're thinking about them, and oh. then you send a selfie back. And I get selfie check ins from people like just out of nowhere, and I'm like, oh, they're thinking about me, and it just. I get a little, a little goosebumpy, you know? Um, and I just, oh, that first month, especially after the surgery, I would get 10 selfie check-ins a day, every single day, you know, and I still get them now a year later. Um, but people just came out of the woodwork to show their love, the meal trains, the people mowing my lawn because I couldn't, um, people just, you know, providing money for a, a fundraiser or whatever, all those things just, and then let me, let me say this as well. My relationship with my wife was already stellar. It was, I mean, we've been together 25 years, love my life. She's so out of my league. I'm the luckiest man on the planet. Um, but going through this journey together has just made every handhold that much tighter, mm. every hug, every kiss that much more meaningful. Every moment we spend together is more special because um, we are aware of something that is true of every couple, but we are more aware of it. And that's that we don't know how much time we have together. And so, yeah, relationships are better. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's, you know, the name of the show, it's, it changes the perspective, right? It just, you know, I mean, not to get dark, but it's every single one of us, hundred percent certainty, we, each of us will die unless they discover the cure for, you know, just everything. And <laughs> yet, you know, it takes cancer to really remember that and then to cherish what we have. So I find that very fascinating. 
Well, if you do any research at all on near death experiences, you know, you start to hear very quickly that anyone who has had a near death experience comes out of it on the other side with an entirely different perspective. And so I would never say that I had a near death experience, but I had an experience that reminded me that death could happen at any time. Yeah. And I think that that's the, that, that's the shift, the mindset shift that has impacted positively on your relationships. hundred percent. Yeah. So David, we have a question from Tamron. She says, did you go to therapy? I have not gone to therapy. No. I, do I sound like I have? Do I sound really healthy? <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds I, like that Dr. Uh, ben uh, was, you know. Ben, ben is an alternative healer who does a lot of mental and physical therapy with me. So yeah. I, I guess the answer is technically, yes, uh, I have been through some kind of therapy. Well, reading all the self-help books, that's got to have helped. <laughs> yeah, that definitely does not hurt. I love self-help books. So, yes. Oh, good. There's another one I'd like to shout out it's called The Last Lecture. You guys know that one? Oh, I've read that. That's a great I one. haven't. It was actually written by uh, a person with terminal cancer, and it was a, a diary of his last year. And it's maybe the best way for someone who hasn't had cancer to get that perspective on cancer. Yeah. So that's a good wow. one. I would agree with that. Really great book. Mm -hmm. And Tamron says she was asking because... She didn't know she needed therapy until she, after she was diagnosed with cancer 16 years ago. So it must have been helpful for, for Tamron. Yeah. I mean, come on. We all need a little therapy. Really. Oh, for sure. I mean... <laughs> we, cancer or no cancer, we all need yeah. someone to talk to, someone to validate our feelings. Yeah, someone to listen. Therapy is a good thing. I actually wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like yeah. every human should have it as like a... You know, you get driver's license training and you get therapy. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So David, has has cancer had a negative financial impact for you? That's a that's a that's a good question, Tim. It's yeah. not something that I've ever really talked about on any of the interviews I've done or even with my friends really. Yeah. Um but Obviously, the answer is yes. And we all know there are expenses, even if a person doesn't, even if a person has great insurance, there is so many expenses. There are so many expenses. Yeah. Um, but it got me thinking, I knew you were going to ask this question. So I did a little research <laughs> because um, one of the things that that I struggle with is I've worked very hard to provide a lifestyle for my family. You know, um, I have a, had a successful career. You know, I've got the nice cars. I go on the vacations, things like that. Right. Um, and then cancer comes along and there's all these new expenses. Right. And money's incredibly tight. And I'm like, why is money so tight? Why is money so tight? And, uh, oh, it's all the supplements that you're taking. Um, it's going to see Ben. Ben isn't covered by insurance. It's uh, traveling to see a doctor, whatever it might be. But here's an interesting stat that I just got for you. Yeah. The average family of four spends about $5,000 a year on vacation. Reasonable amount. A family of four should get to go on vacation, right? That's what we work for is some time off to be with their families. Yeah. Um, the average family of four's um, medical deductibles, right around $5,000. So when you have a MRI and a PET scan and a $80,000 medication shot on January 10th, you just basically gave your entire vacation money away to the doctors. And so these cancer patients who are trying to raise money and despite having a nice lifestyle, despite you see that, oh, they were on Facebook, they were just in Florida or whatever it might be, right? Well, guess what? I don't think that they should, and I'm saying they, meaning me as well, have to give up all the things that we love about our lives because cancer came into it. It's totally unfair. And so, yes, it has definitely caused a financial impact. I struggle with the idea of sharing those concerns with friends and family because when they look at my life, I appear to be doing so well, right? And it seems yeah. very, uh, it seems like a s selfish thing to complain about that. 
So I'm really glad you asked the question because I haven't given myself permission to do this, but I think any cancer patient watching should have permission to say, hey, cancer is freaking expensive. And if you want to help me, feel free. You know, I, uh, yeah. So there, there's your answer. It's just, it's a hard thing to talk about for me, honestly, yes. but I, I wanted to make that point that the, the, the deductible is, is quite painful. And uh, frankly, a, a cancer patient of all people should be going on fabulous vacations because you can't, you can, right. you, oh, I'm going to wait till retirement. You don't know, right? That's the person who should be going on the trip and spending the money and doing all the fun things. And Absolutely. all of a sudden you're, you're $5,000 a year poorer than you were. It's like a pay cut. Yeah. So yeah. again, I, I feel like I'm, I, I, I'm almost regretting saying all that out loud because I feel so guilty even just saying it and selfish just saying it, but no. I don't know. No. I'm sure, I'm sure David, that, that other people will be able to relate to what you said, right? Absolutely. Other cancer patients are in the same situation. I, I hope so. I hope so. Well, David, you know, you probably don't know, and maybe our viewers don't, but I, you know, I lead the Pinky Swear Foundation, and we provide direct financial support for families with a child battling cancer. Because you can imagine, um, I hear about stories of financial distress. Uh, probably I hear 10 a day. I mean, it's just like you just said, it can be really uh, surprisingly expensive and also really difficult to talk about. And that to me is where I find a lot of joy and that that's something you can do, right? You can't cure cancer, but you can help someone financially. And so I really believe, and I want to say thank you for uh, you know, shining a light on it. And the more we do, the more we talk about mental health, the more we talk about financial toxicity of cancer, it just normalizes it more. So thank you. Well, if it's okay, I'd also want to just say, hey, you know, when I very first got diagnosed, uh, my neighbor ran a fundraiser for me, uh, selling some t-shirts and it did raise a lot of money and it really, really, really helped. It was, yes. like, yes. it was, it was such, such a burden off, you know, like I'm stressing about, am I going to live? I'm stressing about how am I going to work? But wow. Now all of a sudden I have some money that I can use to travel or whatever. I, need. I don't mean travel to Florida. I mean, travel to a doctor. Yeah. Right. But um, so I, if any of those folks are listening, I just want to express my gratitude to them. Yeah. I'm so glad your friends did that. And yeah, you get to, you know, be open to receiving, right. And receiving the gift that they, they so graciously gave to you. I love it. Exactly. And the best part is when they send me a selfie check-in and they're wearing my shirt. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Double whammy of awesomeness. Yes. That's fantastic. Um, so, David, how is your day-to-day -day different now than before your diagnosis? Well, we kind of touched on it a little bit. I take time for myself during yeah. the day. Um, I meditate almost every day. I have a little chair under a tree in the backyard. I'll just go out there and sit and listen to the birds, you know. Um, I do a lot more exercise than I used to. I mean, I'm in pretty decent shape. I was in okay shape before, but man, I, I feel great. Like if I didn't have, if I didn't know those three tumors were hanging out in, in, in Liverville, I wouldn't even know that I had cancer. Like wow. I just feel awesome because I've, and I think it's important to, to take your health really, really seriously, you know, like, you know, cancer feeds on sugar. So I eat sugar very, very rarely. Mm. Um, you know, I'm trying to protect my liver. So I stopped drinking alcohol. You know, I've, I've given up a lot of things in exchange for wanting to live a longer life. Now, if you had told me I had to give up Mountain Dew to lose a few pounds, I'd been like, I love my Mountain Dew and I don't mind a little, a little, little something, something. I don't care. But then you say you give up Mountain Dew to save your life. It's really easy to give up Mountain Dew to save your life. And if people just understood, understand that's really what they're doing, that you don't have to have cancer to make smarter choices like that, because those are the choices that will provide longevity and help you live a lot longer life. Wow. I'm, I am impressed. I feel like I've talked to lots and Tim, I'd be interested in you. Yeah. Some people go one way and are like, uh, I don't care. I don't know how long I'm going to live. So I'm going to have the Mountain Dew and the cupcake. And then yeah. some say, well, I want to protect my health. So, you know I mean? I feel like people go one way or the other. I'm just intrigued by those choices. Not, well, not my balance is the other. 
one soda a month. And oh. you know how good that soda is? Oh, <laughs> oh, so good. You know, or I used to have ice cream almost every night. Now I have ice cream every couple of weeks and boy, yeah. is it. Uh, so I still find some balance. I don't want to totally deny myself the things I love, but ultimately I'd like a lot longer to do that. That's yeah, the greatest sure. answer I've heard on that one. Tim, what are your views on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, you know, I try to find a balance. I, I kind of go through these waves of doing well with my nutrition and my health overall, but I try to, I try to find a balance because, you know, like when you're diagnosed with cancer, you know, I, like I found it kind of like reawakened me and I kind of like reevaluated a lot of things in my life, including my health. But like, since I'm here, I want to enjoy life. But at the same time, I want to stick around, right? So it's like trying to figure out a balance that that you can enjoy life while you're here, but make smart choices at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It, it sounds like, David, you've got the best of both worlds, which I would almost describe it as just lovely moderation. Yeah, there you go. I like that. It's a clinical term. I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely moderation. Lovely, mo not just moderation, but lovely moderation. Right, right. Because you like <laughs> love the ice cream when you have it. That's why I added that term. You like love the Mountain Dew when you have it. There you go. <laughs> so, David, why do you share your cancer story, and and when did you start sharing it? What what prompted you to start sharing your cancer story? Well, um, I I I shared with my friends and family, my Carrying Bridge site from day one. Like I, I'm an open book. I mean, I wrote a whole book about my anger issues and published it for the world to read. Right. Um, I, I wanted that support, you know, um, I was a little concerned that people would think I was sharing my story because I wanted the attention. And I'm sure some cancer patients are afraid of that. Um, but at the end of the day, I, really just didn't care about the people who thought that was the case because I felt like I wanted the support and I needed the help. And that's why I started sharing my story. Here we are a year later and my reasons for sharing my story are entirely different. Now I feel like I have learned a great deal and I like sharing what I've learned um, with the world. I want to inspire people to make healthier choices, to um, to smell flowers, to hold hands with the one they love. I want to inspire people. So that's why I tell my story now. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, what advice, David, would you give to someone who may hear the words, you have cancer tomorrow, next week, next year, somebody in the future? That it's not necessarily a death sentence. Yeah. And Honestly, even if it is, you'll be surprised at how many positive things actually come from it. Like if I passed away this week, this would have been the happiest year of my whole life. Mm. Cause I just, I've just lived such a different life since, since going through this. So even when it takes me someday, I will have been much happier for having it. I, it's crazy to say that, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. that's how I feel about it. Like I, I wouldn't go back and change things if I had a time machine. Yeah. Just, and for people who are much worse off than me, that might be a much harder thing for them to hear. They might be looking at me going, oh, well, you got three little tumors in your liver. You're going to be fine. Right. And that's a fair, fair thing for them to say. But for me and for anyone who's getting diagnosed, it doesn't have to be a death sentence. Hopefully they can find the best, the best in it, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> David, you are not the first person to tell me that. I'll be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, when I read Tim's book, you know, perspective on cancer, it's like so many people in that book were, we're just expressing gratitude. It was like a book about gratitude. I was like, good Lord, these people are sick. They're, they've got a terminal diagnosis and they're all so damn happy. What, what is happening? <laughs> right. 
but that's <laughs> that's the gift that comes with cancer is that perspective that 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 you just can't get without it or, or without a near death experience of some kind in my opinion yeah tim and i always talk about how cancer is a club you never want to join uh but you know there's a really welcoming community once you get there and now david you've just shared the benefits of membership <laughs> yeah Oh, gosh. Well, everyone, thank you for being here at Showing Up Perspectives on Cancer. I want to go to the comments for a minute to, to shout out some of the comments. The Tamarin says, that's deep, like what you were just talking about. Um, Mark says, cancer is so expensive because the pharmaceutical companies control the narrative and they only look at cancer patients as part of their gravy train. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Tamarin says, no one plans to have cancer, so the financial impact is has is as people it has on people is tremendous yeah do you want to read some of these erica for sure mm, I, I believe this uh great perspective and being authentic uh that might be your that could be your new tagline david <laughs> i already have a tagline oh wait right, what's your tagline be awesome oh uh, yes <laughs> that is awesome that That's is awesome. awesome tagline awesome tagline of being awesome <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. So David, we're going to go slightly off track here. Tell us about your book, DJ's Off-Road Adventures. Oh, that's nice of you to ask about that. Uh, DJ's Off-Road Adventures is the children book series that I never intended to write. Um, I, I'd love to travel, as you could guess from my earlier you know, comments, but uh, my favorite thing to do is to take my Jeep off-road. And uh, about four years ago, I got invited to go out to Moab, Utah, where it's kind of like the Jeep playground of the world. And I was there with some very experienced off-road folks. And um, they took me on this uh, trail called Hell's Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> And I tell people that the entrance to Hell's Revenge is a little like driving your Jeep on the back of a sandworm from Dune. Like you imagine this worm coming out, you know, and you're driving the Jeep. And it's like 12 feet wide and your Jeep's going like this left and right. It's <laughs> it's scary. It's very, very scary. And now that I've been Jeeping for many, many years, it's not near as scary. But that was my very first experience. And I had a massive panic attack. Like I almost passed out and like my dad was in the passenger seat. He's like, put it in park. So we put it in park. I was shaking. I was like hyperventilating. I was just like, what am I doing here? I just drove 15 hours. I can't do this. I'm turning around. I'm going back to Kansas where it's nice and flat. <laughs> and uh, the, the guy in the Jeep in front of me got out of his Jeep and he was kind of guiding me. The guy in the Jeep behind me got out of his Jeep and he, uh, He walked up next to me and was just like, I'm like, what do I do? And he's just standing there. And these, these, these guys just guided me through the obstacle, just held my hand. um, Just were so patient with me. They were the definition of kindness. Mm -hmm. And then we spent the entire week just going crazy on these trails in Moab and having the best time of my whole life. And I would grow a little bit braver and a little bit braver. Mm -hmm. And when I, when tell people this story, somebody said, well, that sounds a little like the little engine that could. I was like, oh yeah, maybe I should turn this into a children's book. And so I did. I love that kind of like, I thought about it and then I did it. Well, I, I, I was like, what, whatever, I'll just find an artist. I found an artist on Upwork, you know, he's like, I'll do it for a hundred bucks a page or something like that. I'm like, whatever, this is, I'll never make any money on this, but it'll be fun. And so I would, (laughs) you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. I would position my little Hot Wheels toys on some pillows and sheets to like show him the, 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 the storyboard, you know, and then he would draw it. His name is Floyd Leroy, heck of an artist. Um, But yeah, I've got three books out now. They're all about our adventures and they're all on Amazon. We just have the best time with them. Oh my gosh. That is awesome. Yeah. Put the uh, link up, Tim, because uh, we always got shameless plugs here. You get to uh dj's offroadadventures.com amazing that's awesome thanks for asking Uh, about that i know that's not relevant to uh this conversation but boy it's it's a fun project everything's relevant yeah yeah absolutely 
Yeah. And then uh, the, the comment that Mark Kagayama just made, live for today, right? Like, that's what I took away. It is relevant, right? You've taken your cancer journey and you're like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing because why not? And why not right now? Life is now. Life is now. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that other cancer patients might have in common is that we think more about our legacy than we did before, you know, right? What, what, what am I leaving behind? What is the world going to remember when I'm gone? I think about that a lot. I do too. And, um, if, if DJ's offered adventures is one of the things that impacts all these young lives. Like, you know, I haven't sold a million books, but I've sold a thousand books to little, little kids who want to be brave like DJ, you know, um, that's a great legacy. So what the heck? Yeah. So I, I, and I agree with that. I think Tim, do you think about legacy a lot? I do. And I especially think about it more since my cancer came back this year. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. What about you, Erica? Yeah, I think about legacy often. I'm just trying to remember if I was like this pre-cancer or not, but it's always been important to me to think about what am I leaving behind? Because yeah, you never know. Tomorrow is never guaranteed. And so I do, um, I think that's almost like my life motto. <laughs> I have to, I'm going to have to reflect on that one. Um, all right. So David, we ask the toughest question on LinkedIn now. This is the toughest question, which is, what is your one word perspective on cancer? I mean, I think you could guess it. I've said it a dozen times in this interview, but it's gratitude. Oh. Yeah, that's my perspective mm. on cancer. I don't know that we've heard that word yet. In fact, I don't know if you can yeah. see it or not, but I have this tattoo here. It says gratitude, but it's a reverse image. So only I can see it in the mirror. Well, I mean, not like you can't see it, but it's meant for me to remind me to be grateful every day. That is an awesome, that one took my breath away. Erica, your reactions are priceless. <laughs> <laughs> you can always see my, uh, I wear my heart on my face. <laughs> wow. It's interesting. I think you're, I'm going to say what my, the word I'm going to say this week was one I did not expect to say, but it's actually going to be awesome. When you held up your arm there, David, and it said, be awesome. And you've talked about, you know, how much better your life is in the last year. That's awesome. And if that's what it takes, that's awesome. And I thought I would never use that word and cancer in the same sentence. So thank you for breaking me through that one. <laughs> wow, we we made some we made some progress today. Yeah, yeah. Tim, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to say my word, but I think I didn't realize Mark was doing this, but I think live for today was Mark's one word perspective on cancer. Oh, because Mark always violates and gives us three. He's a rebel. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, my one word. I mean, we were just talking about it, and. I, I, I really wasn't thinking about it much in this conversation until now, but legacy, like thinking back to, you know, as we live our life, you know, what do we want to leave for, you know, for our family, for our whoever, and what kind of impact do we want to make while, while we're here on this earth? Yeah. So that's, that's my word. Legacy. Awesome gratitude legacy. I love it. Yeah. Before we go, can I ask you guys a question? Yes. Ooh, I like how you're turning yes. this around on us. What is what is your take on and and uh, I was reminded of it because of your 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 label there, Tim, that you are a host and cancer warrior. What is your take on the the battle terminology when it comes to cancer? Do you guys embrace that? So so for me, I have. I'm a firm believer that every person has their own story. And so I have a story behind why it says cancer warrior. And the reason is that a previous guest on this show, her name is Lori Baker Sheena. She had a conversation with me before um, in a pre-interview for, for that show. And, and we were talking about, do we, and should we, and how do we tell our children that we have or had cancer? And so I personally 
waited until I was not technically in cancer. I'm back in cancer land. But that's something that I that I struggle with. So we had this conversation and and Lori said, Tim, you're a cancer warrior and your children need to know that. So that's that's the story behind why behind why it says cancer warrior down there. How about you, Erica? Yeah, I've had an interesting debate about this too. So, you know, I lead an organization that helps, um, you know, families with a child battling cancer. And I, you just heard me say with a child battling cancer, battling. Yeah. right? Because I got feedback from somebody once where you, we say, you know, uh, children with cancer. And the while that sounds very similar, someone said that uh, using just the word children with cancer defines them and like cancer defines who they are. And that's not true. And that instead, children fighting cancer or children battling cancer was more representative of the journey. And I, I, I've really thought about that. Um, and so, because I mean, I do work with a lot of patients, adults and children, and they don't want their cancer to define them, right? They don't want to be, you know, Jack the cancer kid at school. They just want to be Jack. And um, so, you know, it's, uh, I think words matter. And so I'm still, I would often say battling perhaps, but I, yeah, I have been known to say, you know, people with cancer or children with cancer too. So that's why I struggle a little bit. Understandable. What about you, David? Yeah. What's, what's your perspective? I think that is perfectly fine terminology. Absolutely. Uh, people can embrace the idea of beating it, winning, you know, battling it. Um, what I don't love is the idea that when they, move on that they lost their battle like that right I, I don't love that and for me i don't feel like i'm fighting my cancer i mm -hmm. have learned to live with it like i'm living and thriving with cancer is what i tell people you know um i don't i i would i i i embrace the battling terminology early and early on but then as i came to terms with how much cancer has given me I just had to give that up because yeah. I am at peace with the experience. So to I, the idea of fighting it just doesn't work for me. Yeah. So that's my thoughts on it. I really like yeah. that. Um, and I, I've had this conversation so many times. I just love that we're having it again. Cause I have a, a special shout out to uh, Kelly Grosslags, who is a, a grief counselor. And she did a wonderful documentary called dying is not giving up. And it was about this woman who, um, you know, passed away from cancer. And I, again, my words, I didn't say lost her battle because um, she didn't want to think she was giving up when she passed away. And uh, that's just something I've also explored too. Um, so yeah, thank you for raising that question. Um, but yeah, beautiful documentary, Dying is Not Giving Up. And I would also like to, Tim, shout out some of these comments here. Yes. Um, Got a lot of discussion happening about this. Yeah. yeah. So I'll be at 10. Uh, this is it. Tamarin said, Tamarin, my husband yeah. and I are both cancer survivors and we are open with our children. Which is interesting. And personally, I do think cancer is a battle and we overcome the battle. Uh, and she uses, or he uses um, a survivor who's thriving. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Jessica says, two of my friends are dealing with breast cancer. They surprised me and both said strength as their one word perspective on cancer. Um, not only strength to fight, but strength not to sweat the small stuff anymore. David, that's got to sing to your heart there. Absolutely does. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh -huh. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who put comments in and to you, David. What a wonderful conversation. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And thanks for doing this because I think the world needs more of this. I. I certainly enjoy telling my story and I love hearing other people's stories. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Erica. That was so good, Tim. That like spoke to all of the things that hit me right here in the heart, mind, body, soul, all the things. All of them. Yeah. All yes. Of them. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you all for showing up as you do every week, whether you're live here or on the replay. And we're always looking for guests to be on the show. So if you have a perspective, a connection on cancer, 
as so many people do, uh, please give myself or Erica a send us a direct message and we'd love to have a conversation with you about being on the show, right, Erica? Erica? Absolutely. We'd love to have you. And there are so many beautiful perspectives on cancer. And I really enjoyed David's really hopeful and inspiring perspective today. Yeah, so next too. week's guest, guest is Zareda Maya Morales. She is a chronic myeloid leukemia survivor. Hey, that's I what I have. Oh, wow. We are going to have a conversation next week, Tim. That is yes. great. Um, whew, kindred spirits. Um, because she went 13 years of undergoing chemotherapy, 13 years, and she's celebrating two years in remission, and she's moving through seasons, shifting from the life she was born to lead and the life she's living today. I think it's going to be a really impactful, and you know, with the, the connection that you two have, Tim, I think that's going to be really beautiful. Yeah, it's it's really funny because. Well, it's not funny that we both have cancer, that anybody has cancer, but she actually lives in Astoria, Queens, which is where I grew up. So another oh. reason to be excited about that show. <laughs> All right. Yes. So thank you everyone for showing up. See you next week for another episode of Showing Up Perspectives on Cancer. It's that time, Erica. It's time to dance. Time to dance. <laughs> Bye, Life everyone. is now. <laughs>